Randy shares with us his experience in the secret space program called the Earth Defense Force. Randy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Well, there are what you refer to as these bad actors, I mean, out there. What do you mean by that? Well, statistically, we find that of the species that we encounter, we have a breakdown that we call the 95-5, which means approximately 95% of them are more interested in trade and friendly relations than they are being hostile. It's that 5% that we sort of refer to as the bad actors because they're not necessarily interested in some form of kind, reasonable trade prospect. They would rather uh, steal things, raid things, scavenge things, pirate things, or conquer things in such a way that are less than friendly. But it's the 95-5 ratio uh, that we talk about. And when we're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of species, 5% can be a lot. 5% can be a pretty good sized number. What type of beings and, you know, why are they bad actors? Well, let, let's start with a couple of the classics, right? Some people are familiar with the draconians and the zeta reticulans. So these are bad actors who are using the advanced technology that they have for genetic alteration to cripple a species, to make them sort of compliant as slave labor, to draw resources from, use as a food source, or to hybridize uh, genetics between, and we're talking about the Zetas, in order for the Zetas to create hybrid children uh, to get some of their evolutionary soul back, as it were. It's, it's a complicated subject that I won't spend too much time on, but those are the sort of classic bad actors that we understand who don't necessarily like to play by the rules, don't necessarily like to obey intergalactic norms, but we have other bad actors other than planetary conquerors. You have scavengers who are a threat to just show up, grab or steal something that they can grab a quantity of in a short amount of time and then run away with it. Uh, you have mercenaries uh, who- yeah, What are these plasma, plasmid mercenaries you speak of? Sure, so plasmid mercenaries uh, come from a species uh, in the Hydra system. Um, they are a plasmid, which means that they are what appears to be a gelatinous liquid that a seems to have almost like neon colored lights inside of them. And they're shapeshifters. Oh, I've worked on these beings. Yeah, they're weird. Um, and their ability to take that mass and move it into different shapes, different textures, makes them ideal to be sneaky. So they've accepted that role in the universe, that they're really good at being sneaky and pretending to be other things, which makes them good to be uh, mer mercenaries, assassins, uh, and so forth, because, you know, they are fine to do it for profit and for money, and they don't really care otherwise. They, I'd say as a species, they lack some of what we consider to be the ethical moral center doesn't mean that they're all bad or evil or nefarious. It just means they kind of don't care about other people's moral or ethical standards. And they'll pretty much do whatever serves their interest. What jurisdiction do they fall under then? Who is protecting us from these mercenaries? Well, because they're not a large military force or a large planetary conquering force, they kind of fall under the jurisdiction of local law enforcement. So whatever is the sort of local investigating law enforcement apparatus in the corner of the galaxy that you might be in would fall under their jurisdiction. In the case of our own system, we have our own investigative personnel and our own law enforcement personnel who deal with that and who investigate and will arrest and in some cases even imprison them uh, if necessary. Often the military ends up being the persons who are apprehending or capturing them in the first place, but usually then they're turned over. Are they like space pirates? They're just all over the place well, spread they're, out? they're mercenaries. We kind of think about pirates as being this other slice of the pie. So if I was going to continue to talk about other bad actors, 
I could go from plasmid mercenaries to pirates. And so piracy, it's, you know, not just for the 1700s. Um, essentially, there are trade vehicles going back and forth all the time. You have places in space that are very secure, very well monitored. And then you have places that are less monitored, less, you know, sort of... Um, policed, which makes it sort of ripe for pirate activity. So if pirates get wind of a trade route of something that could be valuable for them to steal, then they just might come along and, you know, rob your ship and steal from you. And if they're, if they're sort of the kindler, gentler uh, variety of pirate. They'll just take your stuff. If they're the nastier, you know, strain of pirate, they might take you and your stuff and sell you into slavery or keep you as slaves or eat you or whatever other thing that you might be good for. So again, pirates are a different classes of different persons within different species so again, these aren't organized military factions. They can be uh, privateers of certain species who have access to spacefaring technology. Or in some cases, these can be individual ships who have accumulated a broad spectrum of species into their crews of, you know, again, much the way in which pirates and privateers of terrestrial past did, you hire whoever's ready to be a pirate, whoever's ready to sign on and do whatever to steal the goods and, you know, party about it later. So pirates are kind of pirates, uh, but it's a thing. It, it, right. it's, it's, a, it's a crime and punishment issue for sure. Maybe you can validate something for me because it's not firsthand information from me. It was secondhand information given to me. You know, we have mafias here on planet Earth. Politicians, the police can get paid off to do certain things. I was told that there actually is like different types of space mafias out there, that trade goes on to allow certain entrances to certain systems to kind of basically plunder and steal. Is that re really happening out there? Well, if we're going down the list, you know, we cover mercenaries, pirates, and then crime syndicates and, you know, mobster organiza style organizations, which certainly are also out there. Mm -hmm. So again, this comes down to an issue of policing. And when you have areas of space which are heavily regulated and policed, you have less criminal activity. Uh, in areas where it's a little iffy, you have, um, again, syndicates of organized ships that have enough muscle to say, oh, this is a dangerous place for space pirates. We'll escort your cargo from point A to point B, and it will only cost you this much. And if you don't pay, then our friends, the pirates, will steal your stuff and then we'll get it anyway. Or then we'll charge you to go get your stuff and bring it back to you and we'll get you a portion of it for a certain amount of money and then we'll still get to keep them out. And so when there's areas that are less regulated and less policed, then you have crime syndicates who recognize that there's huge profits to be made in piracy and protection and all of the other things, you know, contraband. Uh, there are systems that forbid certain trading materials, that forbid certain chemical substances. So what other species are involved with this? When you're talking about pirates and crime syndicates, it can be a real interesting hodgepodge. But when you're talking about these larger groups of bad actors, again, you've got draconians, zeta reticulans, uh, some hostile, aggressive, carnivorous insectoid species. So it is rare, but we do have a few really hostile insectoid species out there. You mentioned the Zetas. What do they look like? I know there's many species and, you know, what is their function out there in this, you know, hodgepodge of uh, diabolical takeover? The Zetas themselves tend to work for other species, but also working for themselves at the same time while working for those other species. So they'll take a job with another species to manage uh, a system, 
but they're going to do whatever some other things that they want to do to ben that will benefit their own interest in that system. Uh, you have the general characteristics that people are familiar with, which is the big head, the big round eyes. The body type is where we see some variation. So what people are used to seeing in artistic or media representation is this small-bodied uh, Zeta with the big head. That's typical of the sort of scientist cast or the piloting cast, but the warrior cast, which they have, uh, physically are much larger. They can be much taller, they can be uh, quite a bit beefier, and their heads can be quite a bit larger. Um, the way that we usually identify the different subcategories of the reticulins is often by skin color. It's sort of a racial distinction. So, What kind of colors? Well, People often refer to the grays, but they're not gray. They're actually more of an off-white. So we internally refer to them as whites. Turns out there's also a dark, dark purple. But there's also a couple of off-brown colors, kind of a coppery brown color. There's a muddy brown color. And there's even a green color, dark forest green so they're a few different colors, and they come in some different sizes, depending on what their job in the cast or in that particular subspecies is. Can that species uh, intermingle and uh, produce? Um, they can, for the most part. They're so genetically similar that they do have genetic compatibility. One of the traits of the reticulins, though, is that because they have done their own genetic augmentation for so long, they stopped reproducing biologically. So most of them, if they have any leftover genitalia, they're not functional, they're impotent. So they, I don't know how many of them are actually physically capable of biological reproduction since they have been using artificial biological reproduction in the laboratory for so long. I think that's one of the problems that they're, they've are they been having to work out and why they want to make hybrids so that they can regain some of the things that they have lost. But they are technically genetically compatible. And who's in charge uh, with that species saying, okay, we're going to grow a few thousand of us this year? You know, how do they you know, increase their numbers? And who's in charge of that and that species? They run off some different uh, authoritarian uh, systems. So they have a pretty strict hierarchy and the beings that are at the top are very much in charge and very much dictate everything that's happening below them. And a lot of that has to do with the way that they are genetically engineered, their brains, their cranium size that gives them greater psionic ability, greater intellectual capacity than their lower, you know, drone subjects. Um, so there are upper echelons within each organization, but they have different authoritarian structures. So they're not exactly the same and, but let's just say that they're, they're very simply a uh, tiny number at the top, larger numbers at the bottom, and pretty much everything that happens below the top of the pyramid is decided by the top of the pyramid. How old can they live for? Thousands of years, my understanding. Their lifespan uh, biologically is between, somewhere between about 1,500 and 3,000 years. Mm, amazing. And with, obviously, artificial cellular regeneration, they can maintain their lifespans longer, but I understand their natural lifespan is a couple of thousand years. What about these insectoids? So, let me talk for a second about insects here on planet Earth, especially ant species, because this is there's a correlation here. So, ant species on planet Earth are mostly non-violently, hostily, carnivorously aggressive. You have ant species that act essentially as agriculturalists who will uh, take out every plant within a certain radius of the hive except for one or two uh, plants and then harvest those like farmers. You have ants that use uh, little aphids, like uh, as a herding animal, and they carry them out of the hive, put them on the leaves, and the little aphids eat the leaves, and then they milk a uh, glucogen off of the aphid and eat the glucogen. Essentially, they're functioning as a herding animal like cows. Um, you have an interesting wide variety of the way in which ant species terrestrial, terrestrially function. But you do have uh, driver ants. Driver ants are incredibly hostile. They are carnivorous. They will eat anything. 
They have been known to take down tethered horses, unattended infants, uh, anything that they can get their uh, pinchers on and will take them apart one little piece at a time and devour them. So when we talk about insectoid species in the intergalactic community, there's a similar pattern, which is most of the species that we run into can be defensive, can be very fierce in a defensive way if you're territorially uh, next to them or attacking them or threatening them, like many of the ant species that we have here, will come rushing out of their hive and bite you and say, hey, get a you know, the heck away from me. But you don't have too many, you know, hyper aggressive carnivorous species. How large are these beings? Uh, the species that were the most familiar, becoming the most familiar with at the moment, they probably stand somewhere between about seven and eight feet tall. They're pretty big. Bipedal? Uh, they walk on four and, you know, use their two upper arms as uh, manipulative digits. So they're pretty big. They're pretty scary. Big mandibles, uh, carnivorous. So they will, you know, bite off a person's head, eat people, tear people apart, uh, use humans or other biological animals as food source or other species as food source. I'd say that they're very similar uh, to driver ants in the sense that they're relentlessly aggressive and hostile and will do their best that they can to consume whatever biological, physiological resources that they need when they come into a system that they've decided to target. Now, I've heard many stories and, and interviewed many people about what had happened near Creston, Colorado, where they sent the Marines in to uh, gas out this group of ant beings, right. and it turned horribly wrong, and the uh, Marines actually tried to put the gas in there and it came back out. And uh, they were all infected and they had to call civilian helicopters in to rescue these people. It was a covert operation to drive them out and kill them. And the what is it, San, San de Cristo Mountains, I think it's called? The Sangre de Cristos. Sangre de yes. Cristos Mountains, yeah, thank you. Um, what could you tell me about, is that these beings or is it a different race here on Earth? My understanding was that this was a visiting insectoid species. It was not the terrestrial insectoid species, that they were exhibiting unfriendly characteristics that we deemed was necessary to want to evict from this particular territory, as this is also an area in which there are underground military bases functioning. So it was determined that this is an outside insectoid species. They're not cooperating. They're not friendly. They're too close to military installations. Let's see if we can't gas them out and get rid of them. And yes, apparently from what I understand, it did go very badly. And that uh, Colorado Great Sand Dunes, is that part of, you know, was that formed from anything to do with the insectoids uh, thousands of years ago or millions of years ago? I, I think that that had something to do with uh, tunneling excavation, which if you've ever seen, uh, you know, ants excavate out a tunnel, they take all these little grains of sand and push them out and make these little mounds on the ground as, as they excavate. Uh, so my understanding is it's likely that that was from excavation of tunnels that was just pushed From like out. an ancient ant thousands civilization. Thousands of years ago, right. thousands, at and least thousands of years ago. And that's why maybe they returned to uh, Mount Blanca Peak there. Uh, you know, if, if there's a hive that was emptied out some long, long time ago, uh, it becomes an attractive space to another insectoid species or another hive settling group. To, In the same way, uh, if a hive of ants left a, 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 a hive and decided to move somewhere else, and all of a sudden you've got this empty tunnel system, it could become attractive to another species of ant nearby and could say, hey, look, we've already got this tunnel system that's already dug in, let's move in. Same thing could happen in this situation where you've got a much larger tunnel system that was built by a previous insectoid species that was then vacated for whatever reason. And then you have another species of insectoid comes along and goes, oh, look, a perfectly good tunneled out system that we can just move into. We don't have to dig. We don't have to excavate. In addition to them being muscular and strong, do they have sonic, you know, like psionic abilities? Do they have any other special abilities? Mind control or anything like that? They have some psionic abilities. I wouldn't, I would say, I wouldn't say that their offensive psionic abilities are strong. So it's not like they have strong telekinesis, strong mind control, um, strong ability to manipulate matter and energy with their minds, but they do have the ability to communicate 
read minds, read people telepathically, read psionically, communicate psionically. Um, so they have a rudimentary psionic ability based on their evolutionary need, but for whatever reason, they haven't, what I would say, evolved towards psionic offensive ability because it's not something that they've moved towards. They still, still seem to prefer um, numbers, you know, lots of uh, attacking sort of soldier drones. What is their, you know, main function and concern in the universe? Like, what what's their purpose? What Do they like to mine? Do they like to cultivate? Um, do they like to uh, inhabit, you know, worlds and take over? Do they have any agenda? So my understanding is the, the worlds that they primarily occupy have been drained of mineral resources, water resources. They're fairly consumptive, um, and they have no problem in making a hive here, making a hive here, making a hive here, and becoming very dense uh, as far as how they occupy certain space. And as they've done that, not unlike the way in which we have done that here on planet Earth, is we have had more and more people occupying more dense space, we consume more. And so they consume more minerals, they consume more water, they consume more food. They are interested in a having a complex functional space fleet. That means that they have to have industrial technology. That means they have to uh, convert minerals to uh, materials, materials to, you know, vehicles and uh, technology that requires a tremendous um, amount of resource. So the hive intelligence is willing to sacrifice any part of its lesser self to achieve its goal. So their way of becoming sort of spacefaring attackers follows that model. They are willing to make massive space fleets that they are willing to throw at the wall and they don't care how many ships they lose. They don't care how many soldiers they lose. That's not the point. The point is to have a lot of everything, throw a lot of something at a problem and overwhelm that system with more ships, more bodies, without any care or consideration how much you lose. And if that's your attitude, then your overall model is going to be one where you're going to need to be producing or taking more minerals, making more materials so that you can replenish the drones and the ships that you're losing. To be honest, they're kind of wasteful. And being as wasteful as they are, they need more resources. So they're mostly looking for planetary systems that have the minerals that they need, food source that they need, water that they need, so that they can continue to feed water and provide minerals to the civilized, over really populated, densified civilized structures that they have, whose only goal is to make more ships, more soldiers, and acquire more materials. Have you come across a species that's not carbon-based or bipedal? Certainly a species that's not carbon-based. Uh, I have and certainly some that are not bipedal, but it, a lot of the species that we run into for interesting reasons that I think we're still trying to figure out, um, the what some people call the star-shaped model, two arms, two legs with the head on top, it is very common, it's very common. But we do experience some other species who have more appendages, and again, not just insectoid species, but um, higher mammalian species that have, you know, more legs or more arms, which can be a little weird and strange, but that happens. Uh, and I have seen mineral-based uh, species who are like silicone-based. So they're essentially made of a, of a mineral content, which it also has a water content to it. So think of a crystal that you could hold in your hand that holds a certain amount of moisture in it so that it's mineral based. It's a crystalline structure, but it's malleable, squishy. Yeah. So, yeah. So like think of a crystal that mm -hmm. would be squishy, but still, you know, made of a crystalline structure because it has fluid into it of some kind, some sort of, you know, mineral fluid or, or hydrostatic uh, content to it. And these are conscious beings. 
Absolutely. The ones that I've encountered also bipedal, as it turns out. So they got the two arms, two legs, head. But yeah, they're made of a uh, complete silicone, crystalline mineral structure. How large are they? The ones that I have seen are what I would say is within human scope. So kind of between the five to six feet tall-ish. So about the same size as we are in my Do they experience. have eyes and ears and yep. mouth? Yeah, they yeah. eat food, uh, not the same kind of food we obviously eat. They, you know, eat other mostly mineral content, uh, but again, mineral content that has a water content of some kind or, you know, oily minerals of some kind that are the stuff that their bodies run off of. They have very different biological structures as far as internal organs and processes, but also similar from what I understand. So they have a biological brain, they have, you know, biological fluid pumping systems, but instead of the cellular structure being based on carbon, they're based on silicone in a very similar way that biological life that's carbon-based operates, but it's also really unique that it's being evolved out of this silicon-based structure. Are these bad actors in conflict with humans? Wherever we run into them uh, and that they don't feel like they want to play nice and cooperate, oh, yeah, I mean, they we're in conflict with them. Other species are in conflict with them. And you dealt with this in a combat situation with, with some of these. Some of them, yes, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what, wh which ones can you divulge uh, which species that you were in conflict with? We've certainly, I've certainly encountered uh, plasmid mercenaries. We've encountered zeta reticulans. I've encountered draconians. Um, we've encountered a few other uh, low level aggressive species, which aren't a threat to us per se, but that we've had to deal with as aggressors to other friends of ours that we've stepped in to assist with. Is this happening today, Randy? Is this still yeah, going on? Absolutely. Yeah, right this very minute. Randy, can you give me an example of this going on today? Sure. We've been receiving some intelligence that we have become a target of interest uh, for these aggressive insectoids. We think that there is a reasonable chance that we might see them here in our own system sometime soon. This Actually could... coming to Earth or just making their presence known in our system? I believe from the intelligence that we're receiving, we would see them make landfall on planet Earth. And how does that look for us for the future? Like an alien invasion. What's the best way to uh, combat these insectoids? Probably with some of the technology that we've been using already. So hydraulically operated battle suits, plasma rifles, gauss rifles. You want something that has, you know, higher penetration power as far as, you know, a projectile or something that has a higher melting point, like a plasma ball. So against, you know, the exoskeletons, which are very resilient and most lead bullets would just bounce off. I've had worked on some of these insectoids before in the projects and their exoskeletons, some of them were like three inches thick and bulletproof for our normal bullets. And they were using special heat rounds. Do you know about this? Yeah, that, this, yeah, they're definitely uh, the, the Thick exoskeletons are what we call sort of nigh bulletproof or near bulletproof, which doesn't mean that you can't get a sable round from a 50 caliber life rifle through one. You can sometimes, but for most of what we consider our standard projectiles that we fire out of uh, rifles Useless. or smaller caliber machine guns, handheld machine guns and rifles. Yeah, you're not going to get the penetration that you need. So you either need a, a different alloy or a phosphorus round, mm -hmm. or uh, a rifle that heats up the round yes. uh, before it goes out, or again, a plasma rifle so that you're getting that thousands of degrees ball of plasma that melts right through. Is there an agenda that you can share with us? And are they already preparing in space something to maybe block them from entering our atmosphere? So let me give a little bit of military history 101 here. So anytime you have a level of military technology, and you can go all the way back to, uh, you know, catapults and crossbows and, you know, metal armor to anything that's way more advanced. Anytime that you have a situation where someone has certain technology, it's good 
at that time. You do the best that you can with it, but nothing's ever usually perfect, impenetrable, unbeatable. So whatever technology that we have in operation right now, it's good, it's really good, doesn't mean that it's perfect, doesn't mean that we can prevent any attack from getting close, doesn't mean that we can prevent all of them, doesn't mean that we can prevent every single ship. It's really going to depend on some numbers. How many ships are they going to bring? How many ships do we have? How many ships do we have dedicated to any other necessary projects that we have them dedicated to? Or how many ships do we have dedicated to other military operations that would be problematic to simply pull from. We're going to have to deal with what we've got. And so we're going to use the best of what we have. We're going to use the best tactics that we have. We're going to use everything that we have been learning as a defensive and offensive spacefaring military species now, which we are. But in no way, shape, or form should we expect perfection out of that, especially with a species that is got some experience uh, at, you know, being hostile. Randy, what other intel can you share with us about this insectoid invasion on Earth? Well, there are certain senior military officials who may not be thrilled about the idea of facing a hostile extraterrestrial force on planet Earth. There are also those who understand that if we don't come to a disclosure event, we're, we're going to be in bigger trouble than if we do have a disclosure event. One of the problems we may be having with that is getting people to agree. So if some senior military personnel were to see the potential for an invasion, that might be the very opportunity that they would need to get a forced disclosure event. So not unlike Pearl Harbor, where someone maybe knows that something's coming and they kind of just let it slip through the cracks anyway because they feel like they need to based on a larger military agenda. This could seriously dissolve the human population quickly. Um, or bring us together very right. quickly. I see that. Yeah. yeah, and if anyone looking around at what's happening in the world, we're at each other's throats and might just be the perfect time to come together for fighting against a hostile exterior force. Are you aware of the secret space uh, force heading out and heading them off before they get here? I would think that... There's going to be some of that for sure, but a lot of that, again, is going to depend on numbers. numbers. When we actually see an approaching, you know, uh, set of ships coming our way, then we can do some math and decide whether you want to send anything to meet them out, try and soften them up before they get close, or whether you're just going to stand back in the best, you know, defense that you have and wait for the first impact and then deal with it. Do they have fighter ships? They do, but mostly what they do is landers. So they will have, you know, big ships that have smaller ships. And then in those landers, we'll have lots of soldier drones and the landers will drop off and they're giant bugs. So they like to, you know, do things like giant bugs do, which is get on the ground and overwhelm. Are there any extraterrestrial allies with the humans that would maybe step it up and help us combat these insectoids? Absolutely. Um, and again, the minutia of that is debate. So let's just say we have the potential of, I'll simplify the numbers. Let's say we have 10 friends that might be able to help out, might be willing to come to our assistance. Then you have to ask, again, minutia questions like how many soldiers, ships, and personnel can that species uh, lend to us? How much can they afford, you know, to say, based on whatever other interactions that they're having in their own uh, space or in other areas where they're dedicating personnel and military hardware? So how much can they give us? Uh, what's it going to cost? Um, not that it's necessarily got a, a, a specific price tag that's like, well, it's going to cost us this much. You have to pay us this much. Right. It may be more like, mm, let's renegotiate this trade contract and then we'll be happy to jump in and throw this many carriers, destroyers, you know, thousands of personnel 
uh, to assist the process. So there's just some discussion over what's an acceptable agreement to them that we can agree to, that they can be willing to help, which is the same kind of a discussion that someone would have with us if they wanted us to come help them. It's like, well, here's what we can dedicate. If we maybe shift the trade contract, we can do this, dedicate for X amount of you know weeks, months, years, this much personnel. So as they say, the devil's in the details. So we have friends, but there's going to be some discussion over who can show up with how much. What do you think about the extraterrestrial civilizations that I'm aware of and you're aware of that, you know, are living on in the oceans and the inner earth? How are they going to respond to this uh, surface battle? Are you think the reptilians are going to come out and assist? Do you think the aquifarians are going to come out? And, you know, what's your take on that? That's going to depend on some uh, different factors. So depending on just how good our negotiations right now are with those other terrestrial species will depend. But we also know that some of their attitude for a long time has been, hey, surface world's your problem. Like if they're attacking, you know, major cities on, on the surface world, it's not our problem if they're not coming underground, if they're not coming under the ocean. Well, they're not threatening us personally, so we're not sure whether we want to get involved and, you know, poke that monster in the eye and get them to start attacking us if they're not attacking us. So they will have to ask themselves the question of what it's worth to them or worth the risk to get involved or whether it's just a viable option to give us some technology, give us some ships, give us some soldiers, give us some tech that we can use, uh, or whether they would really get involved with their own uh, military apparatus. Those are all interesting questions that I don't think we have the answer to right mm -hmm. now, but we're going to find out soon enough. Now, I was privy to some documentation that did show that there was communication with the inner Earth extraterrestrials and other extraterrestrials on the planet. And because we've been so negligent to the surface of the planet and the oceans, they actually are kind of like, well, if something were to happen, maybe that'll just help clean up the surface because these humans are, you know, not respecting Gaia, you know, Mother Earth, and they're poisoning some of their, um, you know, we're poisoning the land, we're poisoning underneath the land, we're poisoning the water, and they use this stuff for survival down there. So there also might be an agenda where let them just clean it up so we don't have to deal with it, and then we'll take over later. I would suggest, based on the information that I have also heard, that we have a, let's just call it a positive, friendly relationship with these folks. But you're correct. Uh, they might look at the situation and go, well, I'll tell you what, if you get down to 3 billion people and you still haven't sorted it out, maybe we'll jump in and help you at that point. But you know what? We think you probably got too many people and you're making too much garbage and you're making too much pollution. So, you know, maybe you guys would be better off without a few people. So maybe we don't need to jump in and help right now because, you know, this could all just work for the benefit and the health and well-being of the planet overall, which some people may think of as a less than compassionate attitude, but it's a big picture attitude. It's if a the, survival. If the big picture is survival of the entire planet and not just one group or species, then that's a viable uh, way of looking at it. Right. As Ronald Reagan said, if we had an alien threat, how all of our differences would just come to an end and work together. Absolutely. I think that the social psychological uh, assessment of the varying social psychological demographics indicate that that's very likely, that with the presence of a hostile threat from outside, that more than not, people will come together and work together for a common goal. Randy, an amazing story. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's always my pleasure to be here. I'm Emory Smith, and this is Cosmic Disclosure. Until next time.